better. So uh, this is this is work. Uh, I'll, I'll be showing results from uh, work of, of former students as well as uh, some of uh, our recent collaborations from uh, you know with colleagues at the University of Minnesota, and, and some of this also was uh, funded by. Um, um, private and public agencies. And so uh, the, the motivation for some of this work is actually, uh, you know, since I started looking at ultrasound many years ago, I, I thought that code excitation was, was key to both imaging and therapy. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, one, one easy thing for me was to visualize was the fact if I have a less than ideal array, uh, less than um, ideally sampled with code excitation, you can actually um, remove some of these uh, these artifacts. And uh, so some of this was more, we were more focused on uh, diagnostic imaging in doing this, but uh, uh, as we started thinking more seriously about imaging with therapeutic arrays, that also became um, uh, part, of, uh, part of our plan. So for example, uh, we introduced the concept of dual mode ultrasound many years ago, and now it's in, in practice, thanks to the work of uh, um, Andy Casper and uh, Dr. Delong Lu, who's uh, after a couple of years with Siemens, is back in our lab to try to uh, demonstrate some of the work that I'm going to talk uh, uh, about. Uh, so with DMUAs, you have fairly large apertures, generally concave apertures, so they're highly focused. And uh, because of the large aperture, the sampling is typically coarse. We don't try to go lambda over two to get uh, high quality uh, conventionally focused beams, but we actually typically have two or three lambda spacing between the elements. So again, in this uh, case, you, um, focusing with the uh, coded waveforms can be a key to restoring the focus and care. They take advantage of the large aperture because that actually gives you a high degree of lateral focusing, therefore very high resolution, potentially um, uh, super resolution, and at the same time not pay a price for using a finite number of elements. Actually, when I say finite, I mean finite. Uh, I'm, instead of going to thousands of elements, we're talking to tens, perhaps hundreds at most for the most sophisticated focusing scheme that you can imagine. So, uh, and, and also in the high frequency uh, imaging field, uh, arrays are being used or considered for frequencies higher than uh, 35 megahertz. And as we look at the current technology, CMOT is obviously very promising, but uh, with piezo type approaches, we're talking about two lambda uh, being typical for some of these arrays. And so when you do that, you don't even have to steer the beam. Any degree of focusing gives you significant grating globes, as I'm going to. So you can do something with reconstructive imaging to reduce uh, the effect of the grating globe, which is typically a loss of contrast. So if you have a cyst, for example, you can fill the cyst with a lot of junk that's coming just from your side lobes and grating globes. So, uh, will show uh, solutions to, to these problems. Let me give uh, you know, a, a quick example of, of one of our uh, dual mode ultrasound uh, arrays. This is a 3.5 megahertz, the brownish uh, side. It's kind of a linear array on a spherical shell. Uh, this data was collected uh, and processed by, uh, by Andy when he was uh, in the lab. So this is focusing the therapeutic array uh, at the uh, posterior side of, uh, you know, side the retina, the surface of a uh, uh, pig eye in uh, vitro, and this one is focusing at the lens, so when you put that near the geometric focus. So these arrays, if we use them in synthetic aperture imaging, conventional, you get fairly high quality imaging near the focus. Very limited field of view, but high quality imaging near the focus. Uh, outside, of course, the field of view is limited, and that's because of the high degree of focus. And we know that, and we can actually correct for it. But for now, um, this is uh, the image of the retinal surface, and you, you can probably fool yourself and think that there is some layers to this structure, which you can hardly see in uh, uh, the, the image obtained by the diagnostic transducer. 
Now, I'm not trying to say that this is the best diagnostic image that you can get. I know you can get better diagnostic imaging. But the reason for the layered structure in here and lack of it in here is the point spread function of the array. The point spread function of the DMUA is very fine in the lateral direction, allows you to capture, even though actually we have poorer axial resolution, we are actually more sensitive to this layered uh, structure that you can see in here. And uh, on the other hand, with the about 2.4 millimeter lateral resolution of, of the diagnostic transducer, you have everything blends together, both in, in elevation as well as lateral direction. So this just to draw your attention and, and maybe the community, because I, I've gotten some pushback on this, where this may have to be deconvolved to get the actual structure, but I can t tell you and assure you, and this will be demonstrated hopefully sooner rather than later, that this is the layer structure of, of the retina, a retinal surface. And you can see uh, three layers, actually, we can argue that these may be the, the retinal surface, the choroid, and, and the scleroid uh, behind. So again, I, I expect as we move forward, we'll process these, we'll show this with, with, uh, without equivocation. But again, this is a property of the imaging system and benefit, advantage of the large aperture that you're imaging with. Um, another uh, uh, interesting thing that Andy has done uh, is this is again the image on the left hand side of the, of the target in our case and he put a couple of lesions and, uh, and this is M mode so baseline and about a second or so of heating where you disrupt the tissue and you can see kind of this multi-layer structure it's preserved very nicely so on M mode becomes very, very clear that we are really following that structure. And actually, in this case, you can argue that, uh, for example, especially this one here, that, uh, that the, structure, the lesion has started in the subretinal tissue, which would be kind of the objective. In this case, we're looking at choroidal uh, melanoma or potential treatment of choroidal melanoma. So we really wanted to, to paint the HIFU shot in the subretinal tissue. So this was very encouraging. It's something that we uh, feel that uh, kind of paints the way for us to start this reconstructive imaging to try to better understand these structures, both for targeting as well as potential imaging opportunity with these types of devices. Another example that recently we started imaging uh, trans, uh, you know, rat brains transcranially, uh, both uh, with MR and ultrasound. So this particular case, this is a, uh, a dead uh, rat. So to follow on, on Elisa's uh, statement yesterday, really no complaints. So for example, this particular image was done by translating this uh, transducer mechanically to create a composite. Uh, it's really five synthetic aperture imaging composed together, stitched together. But you can see that the ultrasound shows nicely the surface, the skull, and some of the muscle tissue surrounding the base of the skull and so on, and it corresponds reasonably with the MR. Again, my hope is that this image will become much more uh, informative as we go forward, but the objective of these experiments was just to see that I really would like to uh, pick uh, brain tissue echo echoes and know that I'm getting uh, data suitable for speckle tracking, for example, and so on, for localizing therapeutic effect. So what we did here is uh, focused at around this point, uh, geometrically, the array, and this is a synthetic aperture, in, uh, sorry, uh, 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 what we call single transmit uh, focus image. So this would be the skull. It's really even more limited in terms of field of view, but it's very useful where you're trying to focus. So this is where we're trying to focus. The beam shifted a little bit. There is also some secondary heating that we observed uh, on the side, but the most exciting thing is that in, on M mode, you can see the, the changes in the, in the ecogenicity of the tissue uh, right near the geometric focus of the transducer where we actually targeted. And uh, more interestingly, when we did the speckle tracking of this data, you can see actually both thermal and mechanical shifting of the data from the speckle. So again, this is the kind of sensitivity that we're looking for to try to use uh, dual mode arrays for guiding these types of treatments. 
And going forward, we'd like to refocus that beam where we want it. So as I indicated in this particular case, we're actually trying to go uh, to this point, but the, the focus shifted. But it was, as you can see, kind of uh, really maintained its shape for the most part. We do see also, like I said, some additional, uh, some heating on, on the side uh, that, that obviously we, we hope to correct as we go forward. Um, uh, this is uh, literally Wednesday afternoon. I was going to miss my flight <laughs> because of this, but I thought it was very interesting given that people are looking at the brain and so on. Uh, this is again with Andy's dual mode uh, array receiver. Uh, we did not do any treatment here, just simply imaged uh, uh, rat brain before and after it was actually uh, uh, subject to a shock treatment, uh, part of the trauma research with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Afshan Divani. And even though we were not able to get corresponding cross-sections, but uh, I'd like to point your attention to this result, which I find, to me, is very, very exciting. So this, in this case, there is a blood vessel. No contrast agent, nothing. Just uh, pulsation through a, a blood vessel. Fairly high uh, pulse rate, but it's very evident, very clear. In fact, I think I can argue that uh, the, the, puzzle, uh, the, the vessel kind of dilates and, and, and shrinks. So this is over two seconds at 1,000 frames per second, you can see. So this is exciting that these types of arrays gives you the sensitivity uh, to, to go down to small, you know, like uh, low scattering uh, data from, from uh, blood flow. Um, so uh, that's as, as far as motivation. I'm trying to, sorry, to, to motivate uh, our uh, um, approach to, to using uh, more advanced imaging techniques, both for the reconstruction, but also for the excitation, so we get more specific uh, responses. Just very quickly, people talked uh, about uh, coding. A lot of the coding that people refer to is uh, one uh, dimensional, simply a single uh, beam uh, with a chirp or a maximum length sequence or a Barker code where you just extend the time and utilize the same bandwidth. So increasing the time bandwidth product gives you improved signal to noise. We have uh, many years ago proposed uh, the use of uh, what I call multi-code or multi-modal coding, where you actually emit in multiple directions and try to, to sonify a larger region so that allows you to process the data in, in parallel so you can improve the frame rate. And also potentially using reconstruction techniques you can also improve the compression in the axial direction. Of course, that depends on the quality of this wavefront. And what we've done in the 90s was actually synthesize the best possible codes on the array and let them propagate and see then how can we compress this thing back in, in, uh, in time to get something like this and, and uh, in the, I mean, axially and laterally so that we can recover the basic characteristics of the system. But again, the idea with this is that a uh, wavefront like this can uh, have different waveforms in different directions, and these can be decorrelated and in parallel. Single beamformer output can give you uh, multiple image lines. So that's kind of our approach to, to this problem, and uh, uh, we're modifying it. I'll show some results uh, later today. Um, the, this coding also requires some form of uh, reconstruction, some form of, form of inverse filtering. So we have also taken uh, an approach. We wanted to do a tomography problem, but we also wanted to live with existing imaging systems. So for example, what I'm going to give you is an example of linear array imaging with uh, ultrasound where we're able to <coughs> Uh, use this reconstructive technique to uh, compensate for the kind of thing that happens when you increase the size of your elements for sampling your aperture. So for example, at two lambda, uh, even without steering, just by F2 focusing, uh, F number of two, you have grating lobes in the 40 dB, which is unacceptable. They become very uh, objectionable. And they, so we can actually compensate for that by reconstructive techniques. Um, and that's what I'd like to uh, discuss next. 
So we, we, like I said, this was really a tomographic reconstruction, but at a simpler level, and we used the advantage, uh, took advantage of, this, of, the, of the way um, uh, <coughs> uh, of the way a linear array works, where you scan your beam from, say, left to right, and so on, at, at every, so the, the grid that results is uh, sampled in both uh, axial and lateral direction, and you form uh, a relationship between the scattering strength at every point on the grid and uh, the received data from multiple uh, beams in this, uh, in, in, in this case. And uh, the obvious thing is that this leads to a system equation uh, that basically uh, relies on, a, on what we call an impulse response matrix for the different points on the grid. But as you can imagine, you have a lot of grid points. So if you, if you will forgive me, I'm going to kind of just show you what has been done because there's a lot of math behind this. But it leads to a very nice result, which is in 2D, I can account for both the side lobes of the beam and the axial response of the system and uh, form um, a matrix equation, form a matrix equation from, that basically accounts for every grid point on the imaging grid. Um, as you can see, as the beam moves, you can see the, well, if it moves, I'm trying to make it move. <laughs> Okay, so you can actually, every line of the image has a, a large matrix, as you can see, that, uh, that forms this relationship between the scattering and the received data vectors from, from uh, every beam. So this is a deviation from our older work where we actually done this for a single beam in, in linear arrays, uh, work that we've done at Michigan. So this builds a very large matrix that obviously uh, the straightforward thing to do is to invert this matrix using, say, pseudo-inverse type techniques, regularized inverse. Uh, but if you think about the dimensions of this matrix, this is tough job, even with the best advances in, in uh, computational power. This is uh, in, in the uh, very high scale. I may have some numbers in terms of uh, the need for solving this, uh, this problem. I'm having a hard time. Yeah, too many. So uh, just uh, if I can convince you of, of the size of this matrix is, is very large to solve, but what we have uh, been able to, uh, to do is to use uh, a property of this matrix. This is being toplets. But because of the large size of the matrix, it actually approaches a circulant matrix. And I should mention, so the circulant, you can see what that means, that there is DFT coming. But not only a 1D DFT like we did the, in the past, but this is actually a two-dimensional DFT. It accounts for both the axial and the lateral impulse responses of the array in terms of the side lobes. And this circulant uh, uh, formulation allowed us to solve the problem in uh, using uh, uh, a Fourier uh, or a DFT, a two-dimensional DFT approach to the problem, um, which is regular. So I, I'd like just to show how this works. It uh, also leads to a very uh, well-behaved regularization procedure. So for example, this, uh, uh, the, the diagonalization process that I mentioned results in uh, 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 the Fourier coefficients in, in axial and lateral direction uh, that are given in terms of the diagonalized elements of this large matrix that can be obtained. These can be obtained through a two-dimensional Fourier transform of the received data from a frame, for example, a linear array frame. And depending on the value of beta that I use, I get, if beta is very small, I get inversion in the main band of the transducer in the two-dimensional case space. These are uh, lateral frequencies and axial frequencies. And if I ease up the values of beta, I 
I move more and more towards the match filter. So this was a very satisfying result in the sense that we took what would have been a, an unsolvable problem into uh, the domain of Fourier transform with regularization that worked really quite, quite well in, uh, or it, it's well behaved in terms of producing. Uh, so um, uh, this was done through a pseudo inverse operator this, uh, that allowed us to, uh, to solve, uh, I'm sorry for this. Uh, let me just move because I, I'm taking some time. So we did uh, this uh, as a test case. We tested with a 25 megahertz array sampled uh, with uh, elements that are about uh, between 0.5 lambda and, uh, and 2 lambda, just to show the kind of performance that you can expect. So as you can see, at 0.5 lambda, there's hardly any side lobes of the beam. At, uh, at uh, 2 lambda, you have significantly higher uh, uh, grating lobes in this case that you have to deal uh, with. And the axial PSF is about the same as you can expect in this case. There is no difference. So on top is the 0.5 lambda point spread function. And the middle is the 2 lambda where you can see the side lobes on a, on a uh, dynamic range of 60 dB. You can see them here. And this is our reconstructed solution. Uh, in, uh, and, and you can uh, see that those side lobes are, are gone. Using field 2, this is the lambda over 2 array with showing very nice contrast of a cis target. Once you use the two lambda elements, you can see significant filling of, uh, of the cyst. There is no noise in here, just basically, just simply the, the grating globe contribution. And once you apply the algorithm, we can pretty much uh, recover the CR as, as it was in here. So this is, the, there really should be no surprise in here. The only, con the main contribution here is our ability to account for the grid in a, and a, a find a way to use that 2D Fourier transform. So it's computationally feasible, but also physically it should be no surprise that we're able to, to do this. Um, if I can, and, and this is just a further analysis. I would like to show, yeah, this is a very nice also result for us that we were able to see that the regularization operator is very well behaved. So if you have an ultrasound machine, the operator could be just like sliding uh, a knob or, or just say, okay, see what, what is the best contrast and the best resolution. All the resolution, axial and lateral, behave in a monotonic way. And similarly, the, the uh, CR and uh, what we call MGR, which is the ratio between the main lobe and the grating lobe, and they seem to correspond to each other in terms of degradation of the, of the image. So again, this was a, a satisfying result. I must have skipped one. Uh, OK. Uh, going back to the future, I want to go back to uh, code excitation. This is new and exciting in the sense that uh, uh, I used field two to, uh, for that PMUA that we saw earlier, the full spherical PMUA, only 32 elements with, uh, with the waveform, to synthesize, as you can see in here, four beams. But these are not any four beams. Each one of these waveforms is an element of the so-called prorate spheroidal wave function. These are orthogonal uh, functions that are usually used in, in finite bandwidth uh, systems. So now we're not synthesizing uh, or trying to find codes on the surface of the array, throw it into the video and see what we can do. Now we're actually uh, uh, synthesizing the wavefront that we want. So for example, you can synthesize a wavefront around the blood vessel for the eye or so just to, to get the best possible signal to noise. You can use this as a form of, of uh, dynamic focusing or so on transmit. But again, what you're doing is starting with what you want in the beam space in the, in the target region and then using our uh, uh, synthesis method uh, that we introduced earlier for CW, we're uh, actually generalizing it for the broadband case and we're able to synthesize these patterns where we want them. And I'll go one for, uh, step further just to show you that this is also can be done adaptively. 
So for example, if I start with one frequency, this is my four focus pattern. This is actually an intensity, an actual intensity pattern, which is going to show you both the performance of this four B pattern as either a therapy B or a broadband beam or uh, so for example here with a single frequency you can see I got my four foci but each one of them is a different length if, you know and also there is significant interference before and after uh, or you know uh, proximally and distally to, to, to this uh, region. As I adapt and I add more frequency components as you can see I get my desired pattern and each one of the foci also has the, the extent in the angular direction corresponding to the correlation length of the codes that I use, which is another pleasant, because this way you can predict what you can do both. And I emphasize this can be used for both imaging and therapy. So uh, code excitation can work in, for both cases. In the therapy case, it gives you better localization of the heating, and the imaging case gives you better signal to noise uh, uh, <coughs> uh, and higher resolution, of course, if, if you're doing reconstruction. I think I showed this uh, before, but there was, oh yes, this one. I hope you can see this, but this is also a very uh, new result that uh, I started. So taking the uh, uh, pseudo method that I did before, that was kind of a mean square or least square or L2 type minimization. I modified this approach recently to account for what I call what we, people call shrinkage in the case space. So instead of just simply using a single liberalization parameter case space, we can actually be selective and remove certain frequency components. Or so this actually is designed to go with this adaptive refocusing scheme that I'm talking about. And I hope you can appreciate this, but uh, the, the wires actually in the case of the L1 minimization uh, are the, both our lateral and axial resolution uh, is improved. This is, uh, these are the original images obtained with two cycle excitation of the Sonics RP. And the wires in here, these are experimental data of course, are the reconstructions with L2 and L1. You can see both of them improve the lateral resolution, but we also improve the axial resolution here and also restore the contrast uh, a little bit better. You can see the, the, the cyst here better defined than, than here. So this is, these are kind of the pieces of the puzzle that I'd like to tell you about for the future as I see it in terms of using these uh, special structures for uh, uh, imaging ultrasound. So we really have real opportunities with using large aperture. Uh, uh, I say DMUA, but it, now you can even for imaging, you can use the aperture arrays, not run away from the F1 and even sub F1 uh, systems, uh, the target, the regularization, uh, the constructive imaging, we were able to really solve a tomography problem in, the, in reflection mode, but you have to be smart about it because and, and the 48 methods, when you, when you can use them, allow you to do that. Uh, also, this L1-based reconstruction allows for uh, both the contrast uh, restoration as well as improving uh, the spatial resolution to or even potentially below the diffraction limit. I am actually hoping that we can demonstrate super resolution with this technique, especially with wavefront synthesis. I, uh, the wavefront synthesis, basically, I can now create a pattern that behaves in a way consistent with what we showed you with the linear array in terms of the, the conditions that allow you to use the Fourier transform for, for reconstruction and so on. So you, and this can be done with small number of elements. So, uh, this array is only 32 elements that I showed. And I, my expectation is when I go to 2D arrays, it won't be much more than that. So, thank you very much. What was the frequency in the red ray units? Uh, three point, no, actually three. The, red, uh, the first array was 3.5, the second array is three. So both of them are in that range. Uh, they're focused about 40 millimeters, they're both F1 in this case. 
So it's, um, it, and I believe for small animals this would work uh, quite, quite uh, well. I don't have to go much lower. But when you go to human, maybe it will compromise a little bit, we'll go down to one to two. Yes, Tom? Did you go through the skull? Yes, this was all transcal. Everything that you saw today is transcal. So we're showing that the beam is actually shifting. Uh, but this is all based on ultrasound temperature monitoring. So uh, we still want to confirm that. But it, in my mind, it's very clear that it shifted from the geometric focus. But the beauty of this result is that, again, the speckle tracking was right there at 40 millimeter, where you expect the focus to be. And it showed both mechanical and thermal shifts. So that's what we're hoping for, is that we use this as a kind of feedback. Of, uh, and then, of course, the other significant result is the blood pulsation that you saw uh, near the base of the skull. I think it's unmistakable. So your, your beta parameter sounds like you're just tuning it, giving it a slide bar to be the best in the but it seems like um, there's probably ways to adaptively yes. just no, actually you can even predict it. It's very easy. Uh, you can actually, as with any ultrasound system, you can estimate the noise. For example, if I don't transmit anything but I receive data, I get a sense of the noise in the, in the system and I, can, I know what's my SNR. So beta is really, it's best chosen based on the SNR. So if you have an estimate of the SNR, you can choose beta uh, intelligently. But what I was trying to point out is that even if you give it to the operator and have them slide a knob, that's not so bad because they don't go very wrong. It's, you know, it's not, uh, just I'll criticize my own work from the 90s. That was not true with our one-dimensional uh, formulation that we had back in, in 95, 96. So, you know, the, the, the regularization was not as well behaved. But this one, you basically increase it and it's monotonic. So that's what I was, uh, pointing out that the operator does not need to be an ultrasound expert or a signal processor or anything. He can just use it. On the other hand, we can, we can uh, actually intelligently uh, find it based on actual system performance. So that creating both the and the algorithm, does it, because there are other methods that have recently came out the yes. last symposium yeah. for high frequency areas yeah. as well. Yeah. So, but there are some limitations in terms of bandwidth for the applicability of those yeah. methods. Yeah. Do you have any limitations? Actually, here? this is completely different. So this is only the aperture that's doing the trick. So, and, and I, it's unfortunate that the community did not pay attention to this, but that's their, their problem. Uh, maybe we don't sometimes uh, describe things as, but no, this is really, your aperture, but yes, both axial and lateral resolution are coupled in the case space. So the, the wider bandwidth gives you improved performance. But it's, uh, it's really accounting for the uh, linear array geometry and taking all the frame data. So we're not taking one beam, we're taking every beam in the frame. So it's a true two-dimensional filtering. Uh, and yet, uh, the formulation is done. It can be done now. The GPUs can, can work. <laughs> I, I don't know, Tom, uh, but that's okay. Maybe you can. Well, thank you. Yeah, Tom. Tom. Thank you.